So um, I'm going to talk about Pipewire. Uh, I have a few slides. I don't have a lot of time. Just a few, few slides. And I would like to give some demos to uh, show you how it works and what is currently being done. Um, so Pipewire is a pipeline-based processing engine for multimedia. There are many. Uh, but this tries to do something slightly different. Um, it aims to sit right on top of devices uh, and bind them together in the Pipewire daemon. Um, it allows you, it allows applications to get stuff out of devices, to share devices, which are basically video for Linux devices, but also audio devices. But it also allows apps to communicate um, between each other. Uh, yeah. Um, so the first thing that was uh, well, what was meant to be happening there with Pipewire was video capture and the sharing of uh, video devices between applications. Um, so in Linux, traditionally, if you, you open a video device, only one application can open it, and and uh, the other one fails. Uh, and also, typically, you, you open the device by going to the device node and opening it and stuff like that, which is not very secure uh, in a sandboxed environment. So putting that inside a daemon is not a bad idea. And like for other things, like the audio devices and, um, well, the frame buffer devices, we already have daemons that do that too. So. Um, so how does this work? Um, Pipewire makes graphs, so you have a video, a video node, and you have uh, clients that basically put themselves inside a graph uh, in the daemon, and it, data transparently flows from one app to another. It can be teed off uh, on ports and stuff like that. So um, I'm going to show you how that works. So important here is if you try to do something is that you can sort of um, have a migration path for what exists today uh, into the new world. So currently there is a bit of GStreamer stuff that, uh, that is working. There's a native API to get uh, frames from a camera. Um, so let me show you how this works. Um, now I'm here. Does this microphone work too? Excellent. So, um, so this is kind of, um, I'm, I'm first going to run the, the pure pipe wire as it works in uh, Fedora 28 uh, currently. Give you some demos about that. Um, you need to manually start it right now. Uh, we don't automatically start it yet. <laughs> Um, but there are a couple of tools that you can uh, use, like pipe, wire, monitor. Basically lists all the devices that are found and modules that are loaded and stuff like that. You can see here one of those devices is a video for Linux device. Uh, and you can use things like uh, GStreamer to get to that, like for example, Maybe I should make this bigger. Uh, oh yeah. So you, now you also have like stuff, you can run that twice, of course, and then you get twice. Video. So the daemon also does uh, other things, you know, you can, you can write your custom logic in there. So for example, I didn't enable debugging now here, but uh, if you close this pipe uh, pipelines, uh, it will basically have a timeout before it actually closes the device, Excuse me. stuff like that. Um, so yeah, that's. Wait. 
Yeah. So, um, other thing that we are currently doing is whale and screen sharing. So this is a, an application of one application providing a stream that is then being consumed by other applications. Like, uh, so in this, in this picture you see, for example, Mutter, this is uh, the compositor. It provides a, scre a stream to PyPyre. Then you have clients that join the graph and take a stream, like for example, to do some processing on it, like screen recording or uh, remote desktop. So you have an app that takes just the frame uh, that arrives and then encodes it into a, a, a protocol for using for remote uh, desktop. So I can also show you how that works. This is all um, standard Fedora, but you have to enable an option to, to activate this in the uh, compositor before it actually works. Um, there's a little Python script. The way that's done is it, it uses the portal to give you a, a file descriptor, PyPyre file descriptor that you can then use to uh, get the stream. Because the portal can ask dialogues, you will see um, how that works as well. So in the portal, uh, you get this dialogue here <coughs> that some app wants to do some screen casting, and then you can select which kind of uh, display you want. Ultimately, also what kind of windows that you want to capture, but currently it's like this. And then you can say share, and basically it then starts a pipeline, a GStreamer pipeline to, to just display it, so you get these fancy things. So yeah, you can write any GStreamer pipe, you can start to encode it to an RTSP server or stuff like that. Um, but we've moved all of that logic out of the compositor into apps that can do more interesting things. Um, right. So, um, so yeah, the one thing that I'm working on right now is audio support. So that's kind of sort of working. I had to experiment a little bit to see how to best do that. Um, so um, what I came up with was the, the pro audio processing model like Jack. So unlike uh, Pulse Audio, in pro audio you work with fixed size buffers and a fixed period. Um, in PipeWire, it's done, it's dynamic, so based on the latency request of the client, we dynamically size buffers for clients. I'll show you how that works. Um, and you also do your processing in floating points, so the mixing and all of that is, is done, and, and effects are just floating points. It simplifies a whole lot of things. Um, so also, Compared to Jack, it's fully dynamic, so you get things created and destroyed, and I plan to implement a, quite a bit of optional Jack things, like clock slaving and, and MIDI support and things like that. Turn not there yet. Um, so it's kind of like Jack with some other things. So important to notice here is that for the audio device, there is placed what is called a DSP um, node in between. <laughs> that basically takes all of those floating point inputs, mixes them together, merges them together for something suitable for your hardware. So on the pipe wire level, you can also connect directly to the sort, to the sink, but then you don't get any mixing. That's for pass-through cases. Um, so um, I'll show you in a minute how that works. So, For this, I can't really run the Fedora version yet. I have to run my development version. Um, yeah, so. Um, there's another way to get into the audio. Um, system of PipeWire via, via an API called the Stream API, which basically adds a bit more uh, components at the server side to do resampling and all the things that 
you usually get in an audio server. I'll show you how that works. So um, that's for like VLC media players and stuff like that. Um, but basically they end up, you, so for example for c stereo inputs they get split up into floating points and then mixed again and sent back to sinks. So um, what is interesting with this, well we can now, with this model you can support both Jack apps, Pulse Audio apps and also apps. So by simply writing um, a replacement libjack and a libpulse, well, simply, um, you can basically use all of these APIs into one uh, system. That's kind of interesting. Um, so I'm going to try to show you this. So this is a little environment script here. Uh, if you're in the development version, it LD preloads a couple of um, SO files to make these Jack apps work automatically and stuff like that. So, um, well, I can run again. Um, for example, you can now do, uh, there is an ALSA plugin, for example, to, um, it's called Pipewire, that allows you to just play stuff. Um, yeah, so I don't know if you hear that. It's coming out of here. Nothing special, of course. Um, but it gets interesting because the way it works underneath this. So now you can start using uh, Jack apps to get uh, to take a look at this whole thing. Um, so basically, uh, this is one one Jack app that um, allows you to see all the connections between applications and their devices, uh, and you can like draw lines and add plugins and stuff like that. Um, but for example, when I start this ALSA client, um, you'll see that it shows up here. I um, don't know why it's silent now, but anyway. Um, so you can, like, for example, use a couple of other APIs. And I'm going to see why that. Ah, you know what that is? <laughs> Kernel, oops, <laughs> not my fault. Okay, so no sound for us anymore. Um, I hope I'll still be able to show it a bit here. But for example, you can have other things. Um, Probably is a bit uh, crazy if my demon is locked now. Mm. Anyway, um, so I'll have my backup pictures. <laughs> yeah, so basically, you have a couple of APIs that you can use to connect, and they basically all show up in the graph. This is different from the um, the Pulse Audio bridge to Jack, because for that component you would also see one component in this graph which is Pulse Audio, and all the apps that go to Pulse Audio, they are not exactly visible. So in this system you see, you see all of them, which is a bit interesting of course, because you can add per application mixing and stuff like that, you can do more interesting bits. Um, you can also more naturally collect, connect, for example, um, a YouTube into your uh, audio workstation and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so you can start messing around with uh, all of the Jack plugins that you have and add them to graphs. And so this is, of course, like you know, it's not very user friendly in in that sense. Um, but it shows you the power that you can have or like the ways that you can make like for example a control panel that sets up 
you know, like equalizer and all the typical stuff that you want in a desktop, um, you know. Um, like that. Um, yeah, so, yeah, most of these things, they, they sort of work together. So um, I can't show it anymore because my kernel, oops. Uh, but uh, if you want to see it, I can show you later. But you can, for example, start an also app with um, a very small latency, and then you will see that the whole graph switches back to smaller buffer sizes. Um, it's, then the CPU goes up because it's a trade-off between more CPU and less latency. If you kill that uh, app then, then it falls back to its bigger buffer size and things stabilize again. So performance-wise, um, I get down to, comfortably down to buffers of uh, 64 bytes, uh, 64 samples, which is like 0 0.6 uh, milliseconds of latency. It's comparable to Jack. So the complexity of sending data between two components is, is very low. It's basically a piece of shared memory and an event FD to wake them up and then they do their thing and the next event FD. So this model proves that it should be possible to eventually combine this, the, the pro audio and the desktop cases. And this is kind of also a bit what uh, core audio does, except for core audio doesn't have the out of process audio units, uh, I don't think. Yeah, so there's so much things to do, of course. Um, I think the proof of concept is there, um, and now it all needs to be a bit stabilized. There's a bunch of things for latency and timing and stuff that's not done. And there's also the thing about what kind of audio policy do we want. So traditionally, we have like per application volumes. But in GNOME, there was an idea to go to more like um, per um, uh, some sort of uh, row uh, volume, like a volume, like in, in most phones, you get like a volume for the, the video and audio players, another one for Bluetooth and things like that, and another one for notifications. Uh, um, so this needs to be implemented in some sort of policy. Um, so there's quite a little bit of other things to do. Um, and then there is, of course, also the video part with the effects. And there is a, a cool app on um, Mac, which is called Siphon, <clears throat> which allows you to have like a video, and then you can process it with like different specialized applications, you know, add effects and, and do things with it, and you can send it. It's exactly the thing that we uh, would like to do as well. Um, some more advanced media processing. Yep. So, um, yeah, that's all I had of a demonstration. I have um, uh, some time for questions if you if you want. Yeah, Bastian. Yeah, hi. Um, so with uh, Jack, you have uh, each client has a real-time thread and does the process in, in its thread. Uh, I'm wondering how PipeWire does that. And also, uh, in Jack, you have like per port latencies. You've got latency as a future plan. Uh, I'm wondering if that's a, uh, what you're aiming for. Yeah, so the, there is... Um, each pipe wire app that uses the library uh, automatically has a main thread and a data thread. So that data thread is using RTKit to be raised to real-time priority, similar to Jack. Um, and then there is the, the latency that is not implemented yet, but uh, the idea is to do something similar to Jack. Um, but Jack has a, has a bit... It's... The latency is not updated um, in real time. It's like when the graph is reconfigured, it sort of updates the thing and 
things eventually fall in place. So I don't know if I'd want to do that exactly the same. Um, but yes, something like, like that as well. And there's also other things that Jack has, like transport. So um, in Pro Audio, you take your digital workstation um, and you make it what is called uh, <coughs> like the master of the transport. And basically it means that all the other apps that are doing things, your drum machines and, and maybe your specialized plugins and stuff like that, they, if you say, for example, I seek to a certain position, all of those apps seek as well to their specific thing. So, um, and then you can like wait until they're all ready and then start rolling the transport and then they all start playing from there right position. So that is also something that uh, is not yet done. So there's, there's a lot of work there. Um, what's the plan for integration into the desktop? As in, I'm guessing that the long-term plan is for Parpoia to be a replacement for Pulse Audio? Uh, I think that's becoming a viable thing to do. Eventually. Right. So, does Bipoya have all the niceties that we would expect? Uh, the demon, you know, the, the the audio processing demon on the system to have, like, would we be able right now uh, to start replacing bits of the uh, bits of the integration, all the pulse audio integration with the uh, not, not particularly, no, not, not exactly. I mean, the, the most viable thing to do as a first step could be to make a backend for Pulse Audio. And uh, instead of going to Alza, going to Pipewire, like that, and have all of the mixing and all of the things in Pulse Audio. But I don't know exactly if that is an interesting thing to do. Right. <clears throat> it turns out that we've been thinking about making some changes in terms of. Uh, Audio integration, pulse audio integration to the uh, the desktop. Probably trying to make that a little bit uh, uh, clearer for end users, uh, a bit easier to use. Would it be worth starting to file some bugs about the functionality that we'd like to see? Uh, yes, very much. I think that that would be a, a good idea. Because right now, sort of all the things are falling into place from a from like an infrastructure point and how the, the components work together. But, uh, and now it's like fleshing out other bits that you need. Um, but also thinking about the policy, I've written it here, policy for audio sessions. Um, there are like, you know, um, I mean, we have, we have kind of things, you know, you, you plug in uh, an HDMI cable, should the audio switch automatically or not? Things like that. So I have, uh, I have, for example, a Bluetooth um, uh, support as well, simple support. It, it, it just shows a note for Bluetooth, and then you can start streaming to it. Should it automatically switch? Should it not? Um, for example, if you do the system volume, should it go to the Bluetooth or things like that? Yeah, it would be great if, uh, if the desktop environment could be responsible for those policies, because right now, Pulse Audio is, is very much a black box when it comes to, uh, to doing that. So some distributions and some downstreams have changed the, the default Pulse Audio configuration, or sometimes it's being changed upstream. But uh, the users end up seeing the effects like a number of months afterwards. It would be much better if we could put that directly in GNOME and have GNOME make those decisions rather than yeah. So yeah. So currently, these things are decided inside a module. Um, but um, yeah, I've I've heard this before, like the session management and all of these policies that it should be outside somehow and uh, provide some way to do this completely separate. Um, Thanks. Yeah. So for the remote desktop case, what's required at the GNOME shell slash mutter level to enable these connections? 
And how does that expose to the user? How does he control it? Uh, it's a gconf key that you need to set. It's uh, on a wiki uh, page. Um, if you search for remote desktop GNOME, I think you find the, I don't know the URL by heart, but uh, it has a little explanation of the things you need to do. There's a Python script you can download um, because you need to trigger Dbus API and get the file. It's, it, there's nothing really an app yet, as far as I know, to do to start it automatically. Um, so uh, yeah. Yeah. I think you need to set that property so that uh, Mutter would expose its Dbus API and that the things actually work uh, through the portal. So for uh, V4L2 support, um, most apps right now, they directly talk to the device. Um, to transition to Pipewire, um, is there a way for you to I how do you support that, those legacy devices? Will you provide a library or like a virtual kernel um, device? Uh, I have no plan for that, to be honest. So for directly going to the device, I don't know. I don't, uh, I don't know. Um, so. my, my other question was, um, you said that the buffer, the buffer size is fixed and dynamic at the same time. I'm guessing that means that it's the same for all of the apps currently, but it changes dynamically. How does that work exactly? So every time the driver, as I say in the note, like the audio device needs data, it wakes up the graph and basically then the buffer size is chosen based on the latest connected clients. And then every client is instructed process this many samples and everyone is instructed to do exactly the same. So you get one unit one fixed unit going from all the sources to the sinks. So you have and to the reconfigure. Situation you can change. So you have to reconfigure if you get a message from uh, Pipewire saying the buffer size has changed. Okay. Yeah, so for example, Jack clients, they have a, there's a, a method, method call for the Jack clients to say buffer size changed. And then uh, the next time process is called, um, they process a different. So I have similar things for the, the Pipewire plugins. Um, so for the other things like Pulse Audio API and the Alsa API, the, that is decoupled. This, the buffer size is decoupled from the client. Because the client say, for example, I'm happy with 100 millisecond buffers. Um, then we send 100 milliseconds to Pipewire and it's like cut up in the slices uh, for each period at the server side. And only when it runs out, we request a new buffer at the client. So you don't have to wake up the client like 1,500 times a second. Thank you. So in most cases. No more question? All right. Ah, yeah, Lars. So how well are you going getting on with the upstream Jack and Pulse Audio communities? Are there any shared interest in working on this? Or? Um, not yet, no. Um, I have, uh, Is there any hostilities? Yeah, I don't know how to, I don't know what would you suggest. Hey, we're going to replace. No. Uh, I'm just wondering if there's No, but uh, I asked, for example, I sent a mail to the, and I've been in contact with the Jack people to say like, hey, I'm, uh, I'm thinking of doing this and this, and this might be something you're interested in. And I got some feedback about that, about uh, session management and the things that they would like to see differently, and the requirements that they would want, things like that. But I think as long as there's nothing that, that uh, can be touched, and tried, that it's still a bit in limbo, I guess. I think when this all solidifies and you get something in, in a distro that people can actually run without setting environment var variables that nobody knows, uh, this is, right. Like for example, it's not entirely ready to, to tell people uh, to try their jack apps. There are things that sometimes just don't work. You know, like the clock slaving and stuff, it's not there yet. So I can't really ask them to test things. It's, I can only say that it exists. Yeah, so. We're out of time, so let's go ahead.
Yep. Thank you. Thank you.